We've already detailed how Skullface uses logic against Chico in the last episode. But now, at this point in Tape 4, he begins to use imagination itself as a weapon. And this is all the more powerful for us listening, given we have to picture all these events with our mind's eye. But don't bother trying to escape. <sighs> Let's say you get lucky. And you don't look very lucky. And by some miracle, you get out of your cage. Let's even say you're able to elude the guards. Then what? The nearest Cuban border is four miles to the east. Four miles of barren America-controlled soil. Think you'd make it? You wouldn't get any help from the Cubans. And the border's a mess of live minefields. Think you'd make it through that? With your girlfriend in tow? Skullface guides the boy's thoughts like a teacher along a preordained path. Subtly here, Skullface is demonstrating to Chico the downsides of MSF's philosophy. With no country or affiliation of his own, Chico has nowhere to turn, no place to seek protection from. No haven. He's all alone, especially now that Skullface has put it in Chico's mind that Big Boss certainly won't come to save him. The boy experiences this as some kind of honest heart-to-heart, -heart, though, what's sometimes called a come-to-Jesus meeting. He doesn't understand how carefully orchestrated everything has been. But if we've paid attention so far, we'll realize how empty all of Skullface's words really are. Chico never in a million years would have made it this far on his own, just as Liquid tells Snake in MGS1. Huh? You didn't think you made it this far by yourself, did you? Notice the phrase, miracle, around 153. And by some miracle, you get out of your cage. See, Chico technically has gotten out of his cage, but only thanks to Skullface. But the dream of such agency and autonomy, that is the dream Skullface needs Chico to cling to. And he gets him to cling to it under the veneer of masculinity. Think you'd make it? Think you'd make it through that? With your girlfriend in tow? Skullface offhandedly refers to Paz as Chico's girlfriend. This, see, acknowledges what Chico deep down dreams of her becoming, like many a boy of his age who's developed a crush. Skullface is dangling, again, the idea that if Chico could only just make it out with Paz, they could finally be together and all of his dreams of becoming a real boy would be fulfilled. At 2.30 or so, Skullface again drives home the idea that Chico's incredibly unlucky. If you were that lucky, you wouldn't even be here right now. But when you think about it, the exact opposite is true, like I kind of touched on. How did a 12-year-old boy infiltrate a top-secret U.S. military base? By being incredibly lucky. So lucky, it's obvious he didn't do it by himself. He had help from none other than Skullface behind the scenes. Skullface all but certainly kept the base understaffed until the right time, which allowed Chico a way in and subtly guided his decision making. Chico, see, has fallen right into the spider's web. This way is much simpler. I ask, you answer. Easy, right? Just tell me what you know. But of course, then, Paz spoke up and got struck by one of the guards. Tell me about your base. Chico. Well? Chico! Uh. Chico demands to be hit. Skullface is more than happy to comply. Notice it's as if Chico's asked and Skullface has answered faithfully. 
showing to some twisted degree that he's a man of his word after all. Around 341, Skullface calls Paz the girl for a second time and crucially calls Chico little man. Everyone treats me like a child. I, I, I couldn't stand it anymore. I'm not a kid, I'm 12. A man only in need of recognition. Isn't that why he's putting on a tough front right now, choosing to be hit rather than to speak? Well, Skullface attacks this premise by saying how cute. This isn't what a real soldier, a real man, this implies, would do. Again. If you're a real soldier, you'll find your own way out. <laughs> Next, Skullface says, All right, All right let's try something else. Try something this wasn't else. about getting answers, really. Not yet. Skullface only needs Chico to break, and first to bend to Skullface's will. And that, we'll see, has just been accomplished. There's a cut. Skullface's switch from striking Chico to pause. Like back in tape two, Paz gets brutally beaten right in front of Chico's eyes. But now, Chico actually, delusionally, has begun to accept Skullface's lie that he has any power whatsoever to affect this torture. He yells, stop it, and what do you know, for a moment, the beatings stop. Stop it! Four steps, a grab. Then Skullface says right into Chico's face, She'll get what she deserves. You see, this is all part of some twisted school session, some re-education. It's very important that Chico is led to believe things in here happen according to some kind of logic, to rationality to, dare I say, fairness and the quote-unquote rule of law. She'll get what she deserves. Skullface again pretends to divulge privileged information to the boy. We were comrades once. Chico no doubt has an unconscious connection to that phrase, comrade. You only really hear this word typically among communists and socialists. See, Skullface is unconsciously or subconsciously implanting the idea that he and Chico are basically united, one in the same. Paz, remember, betrayed MSF. This whole framing by Skullface seeks to conjure any latent animosity Chico may have for Paz's traitorousness. Remember that some of the key personnel in MSF are Chico's literal family, including his big sister, Amanda. And what Chico, of course, doesn't realize is that it seems as though Amanda has already decided to betray him. We've been in touch with Amanda. We had her listen to Chico's call for help. She agrees with us. She said, I know my brother and I know when he's lying. She also had a message for you. I'm ready for the worst. Sounded a little too cheerful to me. But anyway, the irony is that Skullface is referring to MSF's enemy, Cypher. He's shaming Paz for gaining an allegiance to MSF, Chico's own unit, and making Chico feel as if he should be angry for Paz's loyalties to Cypher at the same time. A classic case of doublethink and doublespeak, if you will. Then, Skullface shoves Chico back, before saying, but she betrayed us. The ambiguity of words suggests to Chico, again, that he and Skullface are one. The us doubles to mean all three in a strange way. Cypher, MSF, and for a lack of a better word, men. After all, Skullface has already implied he and Big Boss are old friends, so it's all jumbled up, just as Skullface wants it to be in Chico's mind. Next, Skullface drives the proverbial nail in by shaming and otherizing Paz's entire gender in the most hypocritical, on-its-face, false way possible. This is very effective psychological torture and manipulation. Deception and deceit. What better proof she's a real woman? <laughs> Skullface again suggests that Chico can trust in Skullface and only Skullface. First, he's torn out Chico's loyalty to MSF. Don't count on him coming to rescue you. And now he's doing the same thing to Chico's feelings for Paz. But she betrayed us. And all the while, Skullface is making it seem like he's the one that Chico can really trust. After all, Skullface has honored their so-called bargains, and he's giving Chico, apparently, so it seems, so much privileged insider information. But don't bother trying to escape. <sighs> as if he respects him, as if he's one of them. As if the two are one. 
All this makes the word he uses around 416 a devastating Trojan horse. Proof. What better proof she's a... This is about truth in the communist or totalitarian sense only. Truth as defined by the powerful one over the powerless and as an expression of his will to power. Skullface is providing Chico his final, his only hiding place. Hatred. Revenge. The same goes for Skullface's phrase, real woman. As we'll see later on, MGS5 has a lot to say about the concept of the burden of guilt and the burden of proof in the so-called Western justice system. Now, as if to prove this proof, this truth, Skullface, like a prosecutor in a trial, commands XOF to show him, to present Exhibit A, as it were. Show him. Do you realize what you're doing? Paz, again, tries to use big talk to dissuade Skullface to assert power and autonomy of her own that, like Chico's, does not, in fact, exist. She lays out her belief in Cypher as omniscient and omnibenevolent, a godlike force that watches all and, like Skullface said just now, gives people what they deserve. She, too, is lost in illusions and power fantasies and escapism. Now, she's literally denuded of this illusion. You're hideous, Basil. <laughs> Stripped naked in the ultimate act of literalizing tyranny as an exercise of total power against her. Stripped practically to the bone. We hear the tattered rags thrown aside, the underwear, into, interestingly, a pool or a puddle of water, something that will be very important when we get back to the parasites later on. She falls silent, and the room falls silent with her. Everyone can see her so-called truth, the horrible nakedness of her body that Skullface's whippings and God knows what else have left scarred and ugly, and so exposed as evidence that she is no kid. She never was. Being around Chico's age was just part of her cover story in Peace Walker, you'll remember. That means that earlier when she called herself and Chico kids, well, that was sort of a lie. And it's a grain of truth anyway that it's a lie. And using grains of truth, extrapolating from them things that they do not entail, is kind of Skullface's whole thing. You see, the idea that Paz is somehow morally reprehensible for lying or for spying is a total lie. It's easier to accept a convenient fiction like this than face the terrible truth of both of their own powerlessness, which is exactly what Skullface wants for Chico to unconsciously pick up from all this. The nakedness of Paz's body, her lie, and its many scars seem to prove Skullface's assertions with more than words that she's dishonest and immoral. In other words, not worth forming a conspiracy with, not worth loyalty to. Skullface has brought the two together, only to drive them apart, just like the Thought Police did to Winston and Julia in 1984. After a long silence to let Chico take in seeing a naked woman in the flesh for the first time, Skullface says, Repulsive, isn't it? This actually doubles as an aside to Chico and a response to pause about his own hideous face, yet another case of double think and double speak. Now, yet again, Skullface is making things mean the opposite of what they should. He's teaching Chico that femininity itself, in its most literal form, is repulsive. In other words, not to trust even Chico's own instincts. Now he commands Chico, like one of Skullface's own unit. Look! He then sounds as though he's dragging Chico to face Paz's body directly, saying, look carefully. Again, Skullface is instructing Chico. Watch out when you grow up, boy. This is the kind of woman you'll want to avoid. Like a teacher, like a philosopher, pretending to take great pains to instruct the young man in the ways of the world, as Skullface has defined it. What he really wants is for Chico to internalize these ideas so that acting as Skullface would act and thinking as Skullface wills him to think will all become automatic. Chico will become a weapon that will learn to walk upright. Skullface says, calling Chico by his English analog word, boy, for the first time, watch out when you grow up, boy. He lets the words hang in the air like a pestilence before delivering the final follow-through. 
this is the kind of woman you'll want to avoid. This is all also a way to trick Chico into believing, hoping, that Skullface has no intention of seeing Chico die before reaching adulthood. Of course, what Skullface is saying here is deeply damaging. Nothing a woman or anyone else could really do would actually justify being mutilated and tortured. Moreover, you can't know what a woman looks like under her clothes without becoming intimate, so in a way, Skullface is implanting the idea of deterrence to avoid women altogether, but also in a sense that it's justified to brutalize them. He's implying suffering is divine retribution. Suffering has a cause that makes sense, and that women who suffer deserve it simply for being, at the end of the day, women. This, you see, is directly connected to the misogyny of the story of Adam and Eve, which scapegoats Eve and all of womankind for, at the end of the day, just being more intelligent than Adam. She was the only one smart enough to converse with the snake. A smart woman can only be a deceitful snake of a woman, a part of snake kind. You see, that's the logic, both of the Bible story and that Skullface uses here. Totalitarian regimes are immensely jealous creatures. As Orwell writes of the so-called Anti-Sex League in Oceania in 1984, the party must come between men and women, come between all private relationships, to redirect their primal energies only to the party. Quote, the party was trying to kill the sex instinct, or if it could not be killed, then to distort it and dirty it. End quote. Page 84. Later on, Orwell writes, quote, All this marching and cheering and waving flags is simply sex gone sour. End quote. Next, Skullface tosses Chico aside, freeing him from the sexual torture of being forced to examine Paz's body closely. Now, at 519, Skullface remarks in a feigned gesture of sympathy, Scars like these make it rather difficult to lead a normal life. He then grabs Chico again, forcing him this time to stare at Skullface's own hideous face, his own naked truth, before saying, I should know. You see, he's only painting Paws in a momentarily sympathetic light to redeem his own monstrousness. This is all just to excuse what he does next. At 5.32, he barks another order to XOF, continued. And this is where things get really messed up and graphic. So I warn you, there is some sexual assault content coming up. We hear the soldier come over and lift Paz's chain, spreading her arms wide open like in a medieval dungeon, leaving her lower half defenseless. With that, Skullface dangles the dream that Chico has all the power by saying, talk and you both go free. Again, a case of a perfect logical statement, a logical proposition on its face, but one loaded with venom. See, Skullface knows that Paz will yell at Chico just like she did before to prevent him from breaking because she's still loyal to MSF. Skullface is now using this against her because when she predictably does this, now it just makes it seem to Chico on some level that maybe Paz doesn't want to be freed, that maybe she wants what's in store, that maybe this slavery is freedom. The XOF man seemingly drags over a surface to drape Paws over, and as Skullface says, only you can stop this, the XOF man undoes his belt. This also perverts Chico in a way. Skullface is mixing together love and hate, sex and violence, war and peace, suffering and revenge, and he's put both Chico and Paws into positions or no matter what they do, it will end up serving Skullface's ends, and will seem to justify them in the ultimate act of torture and manipulation. Skullface knows a couple things. He knows Paws won't let Chico talk when they're in each other's presence. Tell me about your base. Chico. Well? Chico! Uh. He knows Chico will follow her lead. Chico! Uh. <sighs> Hit me! And he knows Paws will refuse to talk no matter what. Do you realize what you're doing? Cypher is watching. The question for Skullface throughout these tapes is how to play the two off each other, how to get them both to talk. He uses these premises like a logical proof to construct this nightmare scenario of rape and sexual dysfunction and torture to frame the both of them, just like the party frames Winston as no better than a rat. 
Skullface makes it seem like Chico once paused to be raped. Talk, and you both go free. Chico! And makes it seem that Paws on some level wants it too. Don't. Only you can stop this. Don't talk! All of this is a total lie, again to conceal just how utterly trapped and powerless they both are. Skullface would never offer to free them both right here. This is all about torturing them with each other, breaking down their resistances, and subjecting them to the kind of suffering from which they'll never recover. Quote, There were things, your own acts, from which you could never recover. Something was killed in your breast, burnt out, cauterized out. End quote. 1984, page 367. And the next quote is from O'Brien speaking to Winston in the torture chamber. Quote, What happens to you here is forever. Understand that in advance. We shall crush you down to the point from which you could not recover if you lived a thousand years. Never again will you be capable of ordinary human feeling. Everything will be dead inside you. Never again will you be capable of love, of friendship, or joy of living, or laughter, or curiosity, or courage, or integrity. You will be hollow. We shall squeeze you empty, and then we shall fill you with ourselves. End quote. Page 323. 552. There's a rupture of static, and then we're transported over a gap in time back into Chico and Paz's dog cages. The crickets are quiet tonight, but Paz, either in a trance or in a dream, begins to hum. It's the imperfect melody of Love Deterrence, Chico's favorite song. She's escaped mentally back into the peace day that never came. She sounds at 604 almost like a baby. Pause has regressed mentally to escape herself just as she had to do somewhat on Mother Base. At 609, Chico calls her name. The humming stops. Pause. She's conscious after all and her song is sweet torture for Chico, no longer a boy. At 6.11 or so, in the heavy silence between them, a bird cries out in the distance. We can faintly detect the gentle hum of the tape recorder itself. Then Chico asks the one question that Paz cannot answer. Why? Why? This proves Chico has bought into Skullface's illusion, the illusion that this slavery is freedom. As Winston's Inquisitor explains to him in 1984, quote, We are the priests of power, he said. God is power. But at present, power is only a word so far as you are concerned. It is time for you to gather some idea of what power means. The first thing you must realize is that power is collective. The individual only has power insofar as he ceases to be an individual. You know the party slogan, freedom is slavery. Has it ever occurred to you that it is reversible? Slavery is freedom. Alone, free, the human being is always defeated. It must be so because every human being is doomed to die, which is the greatest of all failures. But if he can make complete, utter submission, if he can escape from his identity, if he can merge himself in the party so that he is the party, then he is all-powerful and immortal. We cut again at 6.16. Now we can only assume that, given the specified date of March 12th, that the two prisoners are not being allowed to sleep. They're dragged back down into hell for even worse atrocities. We're blasted in the ears with more of the recording of a recording of love deterrence. That we then cut at 6.20, interrupting more of Paz's pain grunts, the rattle of her medieval chain. Now this is pretty terrible, but this is a literal case of coitus interruptus. We've barged in sonically onto what can only be a recording of Paws being raped. Then at 629, Skullface commands move. Immediately the male guard does so, zipping up his pants at 632. 
Skullface takes two steps, then says, get up. Clearly, Chico's been forced to observe Paz's rape at close range. There's a shocked silence. Chico can only say, huh? Skullface, you heard me. Throughout our time down here, we can hear both steam and dripping water. A boiler's purpose is heating fluid, usually water, and vaporizing it. Now, the closest match I could find to the kind of boilers that we're seeing in Ground Zeroes are the ones called a fire tube boiler. This could be used for a variety of purposes, notably including sanitation. One of the threats that O'Brien makes to Winston while he's being re-educated is that he will be vaporized, that nothing, no trace of him will remain. The boiler's presence in Cuba recalls an infamous event in 1964, jokingly known as the Cuban Water Crisis, when Fidel Castro cut off Guantanamo Bay's water for three days. The result was the U.S. flew in desalinization technology to be able to convert seawater into a potable source. Without running water, sanitary conditions plummet and epidemics are easily spread. Anyway, next Skullface grabs Chico and audibly drags him over to pause. At 6.47 or so, chillingly, Skullface mimics the voice and the words of the villainous character Brandon Shaw from Alfred Hitchcock's 1948 classic of suspense, Rope, a film which MGSV's entire visual style is a reference to. But I'm gonna look inside that chest. No! Are you crazy? I hope so. With all my heart, I hope I'm crazy. Uh, Rupert, this has nothing to do with you. It got to. Don't. Uh, Rupert. Got to look inside that chest. All right. Go ahead and look. I hope you like what you see. Do you like what you see? <gasps> I said, do you like what you see? 